Thanks for downloading this week's episode of the Mental Health Book Club podcast. Before we get started with the main episode, I'd like to draw your attention to some research from the University of Melbourne. They are calling for participants to take part in a research study called Social Media, Young Adults and Wellbeing. If you are aged between 18 to 34 years old and have 15 minutes to spare, you would be helping out immensely by filling in the survey. The survey is completely anonymous and it's looking to find out how you guys use social media and how that impacts your mental health. If you are interested in taking part in this survey, I shall put a web address into the show notes for you. The idea is to help with identifying ways to help make social media safer for young adults like yourselves. I've taken the survey because I am just in that bracket, woohoo, and it did take about 15 minutes and it asked lots of different questions about your use of different social networking, whether you use blogs, whether you use wikis, all of those kind of things. So if you feel that you can help out, just click the link in the show notes. Hello and welcome to the Mental Health Book Club podcast with your hosts Sydney Timmons and Becky Lawrence. We would like to take this opportunity to let you know that we will be covering a diverse range of mental health topics that may be distressing to some listeners. You can find a full list of the topics being covered in each episode in the show notes. Please check the show notes before listening to any of our episodes. Welcome to the Mental Health Book Club podcast with me, Sydney Timmins. And usually our schedule would mean that this episode would be a book review episode. However, because of all of the interesting stuff that the secret psychiatrist highlighted last time, I thought it would be better to release the three episodes we recorded about my courage to tell. So I am extremely happy to welcome back to the podcast, The Secret Psychiatrist. Hello, everybody. That's me. So happy to be back here with you. Fantastic. So last time we spent the episode talking about post-traumatic stress disorder, which was one of the things that you had highlighted from My Courage to Tell. And one of the other things that we talked about briefly before we started recording was this issue of abuse and how Laura has been subjected to abuse throughout her childhood, which then led on to her development of PTSD. So I thought perhaps today this episode could be more focused on the abuse aspect of what Laura went through, if that's okay. Yes, that's fine. And I thought we would start this podcast just as a quick reminder with the book blurb again. So My Courage to Tell by Laura E. Corbeth says, My Courage to Tell is the story of one woman's struggle to overcome a childhood of abuse at the hands of her cruel, bullying brother. Memories of this abuse remain deeply buried until an aunt dies in Manhattan, leaving an estate Laura Corbeth must settle with her estranged brother. As she tries to administer the estate, Laura is played by symptoms of post-traumatic stress. Suppressed memories start to rise to the surface. Laura begins to remember and to face a childhood of psychological and physical abuse. No cuts, no bruises, no scratches. Her brother is sly, constraining her to spit in her face, lick her or perform tickle torture. He took pleasure in dominating her and playing on her fears relishing his control over his younger sibling. His lies and manipulations terrified her. Witnessing his torture of animals left no doubt in Laura's mind that her tormentor would follow through on his threat that he would kill her if she told. And where were her parents? Rather than investigating Laura's deteriorating situation, they believed their son's continuous lies as he denied his abuse of Laura. When they did catch glimpses of their son's cruelty, They put it down to sibling rivalry. But it was not sibling rivalry. It was ruthless, relentless, psychological and physical abuse. And by not dealing with it, her parents were complicit. Unheard, unprotected, Laura was completely on her own. My Courage to Tell is one of the first memoirs to shine a light on abuse from a sibling's perspective. It also reveals how families that buy into the lies and manipulations ignore the problems and stonewall, enable the abuser and foster mental illness. 
travel with Laura as she uncovers her past, finds the help and courage to face the past, and ultimately confronts her abuser and her family. So let's get started. I just like to warn those listeners listening that we will be talking about abuse in detail and I will be talking about sexual abuse with that as well as physical abuse. So it's quite sensitive information. So if you feel uncomfortable or you would like to change where you are listening in case there's children around or other vulnerable individuals, please take that into consideration. And anyone affected, there will be some links provided and contact details at the bottom of the podcast for anyone that needs so. But I think let's start with child abuse, if that's okay. Before I talk about sort of the facts from a psychiatrist, what do you know about it, Sydney? Or what are the kind of things that you would like to know? So in terms of the child abuse, really what I found quite interesting, and I know that what I need to remember is that this actually happened. This Mm. is a true story based on a little girl's life. Yes. And just listening or reading her words brings to life how much hell this poor child was going through. And I'm surprised by the end of the book that there isn't more mental health issues just for her at the end. But she has survived so impressively but what kind of things could happen to someone who is subjected to this kind of emotional and physical abuse at a young age and how could that travel with them through their life? Mm, I think those are really common questions so I'll definitely tackle that so all right let's get started so child abuse I think everyone knows about child abuse but the four main ones are sexual abuse physical abuse neglect and emotional psychological abuse so physical abuse is when an individual so we're talking about children so I'll relate it to children they cause intentional injury to that child so that could be in the form of kicking biting punching beating It's what we call non-accidental physical injury, and that can also involve poisoning. Yeah, I totally have to agree. I wouldn't have considered poison to be part of the abuse bracket, but it definitely makes sense because I guess if a parent was giving their child, say, medication that wasn't prescribed for them, that was then making them sick, then of course, why wouldn't it be classified as abuse? Definitely. Uh, With poisoning, you have to also be thinking about particularly food and drink because obviously the parent's providing for the child. So if you're giving them something contaminated or something that you've infiltrated with a substance, then that would go with poisoning. Mm. Okay, so that's what physical abuse is. Sexual abuse is different in that it involves and not many people know this, it can involve two children involved where one is significantly older and that can be using coercion, but it can also involve a child with an adult. And here, this can be with the same sex or it can be of an opposite sex for the victim. And that can involve issues of non-genital or genital fondling, exhibitionism. So that's when you expose yourself to that child, not necessarily having to touch them, but exposing body parts. It can involve other things such as vaginal, anal, oral penetration. So can I ask, what kind of impact can sexual abuse have on a child later on in life? Yeah, some of the things from abuse that can happen later down the road for the victim, they can be more prone to depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, conduct disorder, which I'll talk about later on somatization so what that is is you know like hypochondriacs they have one thing that they keep thinking they have so it might be oh I think I've got heart disease I think I've got heart disease but with somatization you think you've got an array of different symptoms so it might be and this is an example oh I've got heart disease I've got skin cancer I've got brain cancer the list is endless so it it depends on that victim and also suicidal behavior is also seen with those history of sexual abuse There are just so many long-lasting effects that a child can have as a result of sexual abuse. I was wondering if there were any gender and age differences in terms of a child's risk of sexual abuse. 
Yeah, typically girls are more likely to be the victim. So it's normally four girls to one boy. The age can happen at any time. Different studies say different things, but it's typically, but it can happen any age, nine to 11 year olds, really. So just something that I've read on the internet that I think is probably the view of quite a few people is that people believe that the perpetrators of sexual abuse are generally older men, that only men sexually abuse children, and that sexual abuse of children is typically carried out by a stranger. And I was just wondering whether those were true or not. These are very common myths, and these are a lot of questions that people bring, and I've seen this myself on the internet. So thank you for asking me that. So, right, it's not only men that abuse or even sexually abuse children. It's approximately 90% male, but women can also. And of note, it's just not adults that abuse children or sexually abuse children. Approximately 20% of adolescents actually are the perpetrator. And on top of which, it's not normally a stranger. I know when we see films and you get worried of your child going out, you know, with a stranger after school, it's actually 90%. The the victim actually knows the perpetrator and it's approximately 70% by a family member. Really? That high? It's very, very high. And if you think about it, it makes sense because those who are more in contact with a child probably knows that child very, very well. Yeah. And then I guess, again, the child wouldn't necessarily be switched on to it, knowing that there is something wrong that's going on. Yeah, I mean, they can't... Even though they probably feel it deep down that, hang on a minute, I don't think this is right. But I guess access to a child makes the perpetrator's life easier, which is is sad that I'm saying that it makes their life easier but I'm guessing that access is a huge deal. Yeah because if you think about it it's not like you have a child outside on their own do you they're always usually around with someone but even when you're older and you're a victim of abuse it's still typically someone you know it's not normally a stranger either. Mm. Now psychological abuse and emotional abuse that's I mean, it's exactly what it says on the tin. It's when a child is left feeling worthless, unwanted, unloved, endangered in some sort of way. Now, neglect, and not many people are aware of this because normally films portray physical or sexual abuse, but neglect is one of the largest form of child abuse. And that's when the child doesn't have adequate care or protection. Um, They're not being fed, they're not being clothed properly. You're not having their emotional needs met, they're not going to school, withholding physical services, taking them to the doctor or something like that. Again, something that I have heard other people say is that they think that neglect isn't as bad as other forms of abuse. But I was wondering your view on that. Me personally, I think neglect is probably equally, if not worse, than other types of abuse. But what's your opinion? I have to disagree. I think neglect is one of the most dangerous forms of abuse. And if you think about, obviously, what it is, as I've explained, if you're not even feeding your child, they are going to die. And so the increase in morbidity and mortality for a child is so high with neglect. And because it's one of the largest forms, I think people need to take it much more seriously. And because people highlight so much more with physical and sexual abuse, Yes, I agree that is equally horrific, but neglect is so huge and predominant in child abuse and it's very, very dangerous and the child can easily die from neglect. And there's an excellent film I remember when I was growing up watching um, Goodnight Mr. Tom and it's about an orphan boy and his mother is very abusive to this boy, but she neglects him as well, so much so that his little sister actually dies because she's not being fed, watered, clothed, changed. So that's a form of neglect, leaving your child, not feeding them, providing them adequate warmth and support, psychologically, physically as well. And it's incredibly dangerous. I mean, just recently in the press, we've seen the American family that had 
been basically their neighbours didn't really realise what was going on, but that the parents were neglecting their children and one of them, I believe, managed to escape the house and was able to alert the authorities. But they thought that she was a lot younger than what she actually was because of the neglect Mm. and the malnutrition associated. So, yeah, I think it's pretty horrific. All abuse is horrific, but I guess with neglect being so prevalent in the scheme of things that you go wow this is this is tough Mm, and you're right because it affects your your growth um your cognitive development your social development and because it impacts so many different areas of the child's upbringing it makes it even more dangerous Mm, it's just i just i have to admit this particular episode i'm finding pretty tough Okay. But that's probably because I guess I'm able to relate to some of it more so than maybe other episodes that we're going to do. So it's just interesting. I mean, abuse, I think, is really difficult to swallow Mm. for anybody. And I think it's a very sensitive topic. It's always one that you, you know, it comes with a sort of a dark shade of a cloud coming over it's a very uncomfortable topic you know no one wants to discuss it it's it's really horrific I remember when I worked in a GP practice and I was concerned a little girl was being abused and her mom it was such a difficult Mm. conversation to have with her mother and she was so barriered with me and there's no way around it unfortunately when you talk about abuse or listen to it you've got to unfortunately be sensitive but you've got to just be direct as well there's no way to cover it and I think that's why it makes it even harder so I can appreciate that it's 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 quite a difficult podcast to talk about actually but very important on the other hand I think that talking about it highlights what difficulties there are out there for children and what we should be looking for and the consequences of abuse no exactly and I mean one of the reasons for abuse happening is because people obviously don't even want to think about it or acknowledge it and it's important not to shy away from it either you've got to kind of go in with your eyes open and just tackle what's going on Mm -hmm. so if people close off from it that's just going to make the problem worse yeah Definitely. So of these cases, approximately 60% of child abuse is down to neglect, 20% physical, 10% sexual abuse, and 10 the emotional, psychological sort of abuse. That shocked me. I know that in some respects, I'm guessing physical abuse can be identified because it's easier to see because there is physical harm being inflicted. And... I was just wondering your opinion. Do you think that there is a lack of reporting in some of the abuse situations, the four that you mentioned? I think there is there is a lack of reporting. But if you think about that psychologically, if you were purposely hurting your child... You're not going to tell. Would you want to get caught? Yeah. I mean, it's human behaviour. Would you come forward with that? I'm not sure you really would, um, unless you're wanting to deal with the consequences. Don't get me wrong, there are parents that do, but usually it's because someone's noticed or there's some sort of safeguarding coming in or social services. But, I mean, if you think about it, if you're purposely causing pain onto your child, you're not really going to come forward willingly. Yeah, definitely. So you've mentioned potential consequences of people who have been subjected to physical abuse is there any differences for those suffering sexual abuse now as i said what can increase in sexual abuse but overall there are increased rates as i said of post-traumatic stress disorder depression self-destructive behavior in the victim later on they can also themselves have sexually inappropriate behavior towards others later on they can be more at risk of having drug or alcohol problems or substance abuse eating disorders, oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, borderline traits as well. So that's what the victim can have later on. So again, there are 
a lot of serious consequences for people who have been subjected to sexual abuse. Yes, I completely agree with you. I thought at this point as well, it's important for those listening just to be aware of some of the signs of the different kinds of abuse. So I agree. I really do think it's important for people to know the signs of childhood abuse so that they can have an idea of being able to find a way to help that child. Yes, I think that there are subtle signs and there's obvious signs as well. And they're slightly different for the four different categories. And I'll share them now with you so everyone knows what to look out for in the different types, because you never know if someone is suffering from it and you just recognise them that could really, really help them. Yeah, definitely. And as a result of knowing those signs, we could be saving a child's life. Absolutely, absolutely. So with physical abuse, you might see that a child doesn't really want to discuss any injuries that they might have, or they might make excuses for why they have an injury. That's not the truth. They might delay in reporting, so to the teacher or the doctor, certain injuries they have. So they might have fractures or burns that they don't let other people know of, especially if it's recurrent as well. And also, obviously, you might just see on the child obvious bruises or injuries displayed if it's not being covered up. How about for neglect? What signs do you see or would you see for children that were going through neglect at home? Now, signs of possible physical neglect might be the child's really hungry, very poor hygiene, tatty clothes, they haven't been washed, the child's very, very tired, not coming to school sometimes or they see you might think the child's being naughty because they might be late coming to class so that might be another sign and also untreated medical problems as well can i ask about the incidence of abuse in different population groups are there any differences at all now physical abuse now this can happen in all different social levels high and low but mostly it is associated with poverty psychological stress and financial stress within their family but it can happen at any you know, higher class, lower class. Physical abuse typically happens around adolescence and it's very strongly related to parents not having strong education, low IQ, they're not employed, poor housing, welfare reliance or a single parent. That could be related to stress factors, why the child's being the victim. Child abuse tends to also occur in families that have lots and lots of problems in the family. So it could be domestic violence, can also be parental mental illness, parental substance abuse, especially alcohol, and that's something to consider as well. But even if the family is very isolated from friends and support system as well, so that can be other sort of risk factors to look into. Other things is the parents being a very young age, and that goes with not being very well educated because they're just so young themselves. They could have a criminal record themselves. They might not have good parenting skills, um, and they might have been abused themselves or have psychiatric problems when they were growing up as well or with their own parents. So with the child themselves, Mm -hmm. they might be at risk more of being physically abused if the child themselves has congenital malformation, a learning disability, some sort of chronic illness that's very difficult for the parent to maintain and support the child or they might be they might have a very difficult temperament so they might be crying all the time they might be a child that shouts or screams and it's quite difficult for the parent to control and support and also there's a risk of child abuse if families have lots and lots of children in one household of a very young age as well is there anything that has surprised you about what i've said or you want to comment on Just relating some of the stuff you said back to Laura's case. So what we see with her is that she is being physically abused by her brother. She's being emotionally abused and psychologically abused by her brother. But there is also a case of neglect in terms of the way her parents are dealing with it. So she's kind of suffering with three out of the four because there's no mention in the book of any sexual abuse, thankfully. But poor Laura is sat in this situation where there's these three different abuses piling on. As a child, how do you think that's going to 
don't want to say impact her, but she's not necessarily going to know that there's anything wrong, is she? This is just the way it is. Yes, I think, I mean, that is a very ethical question, actually, and one that lots of doctors talk about. I mean, it depends on the age of the child as well. I mean, some children will know that this is wrong. This doesn't feel right. Some children won't know because it's happened at such a young age before they've got the capacity to develop their own mind and be able to question what's going on and be strong enough to understand that. And you have to remember, children are developing also cognitively. So what's happening to them is being sort of installed into them, possibly. And they might not know the difference between right and wrong. They might just feel it, but not understand, you know, why is mum or dad doing this to me? Why are my siblings doing this? What have I done wrong? And putting that onto themselves that I have done something when, you know, objectively it's wrong. But how is a child meant to know that? It's like if you're eating the same cereal every day, that is cereal to you when in fact it could be something very poisonous, if that makes sense. Yeah, that really does make sense. So I, let's talk about the other sort of signs of the other abuses. So signs of other sort of non-organic failure to thrive, going with emotional abuse could be very low self-esteem in a child. They don't appreciate themselves. Sudden speech disorder that can be seen at school and usually teachers pick up on that. And also sort of neurotic behavior as well. So a child also might self-mutilate themselves. So they might be banging their head, biting their hands, trying to harm themselves in some way. So that's something to really be looking out for. If there's a sudden change in character, you would like to think about emotional abuse there. Signs of possible sexual abuse. I mean, some are quite obvious, but it might be some people that know lack of trust in adults or being actually very over familiar with adults. So not behaving in the correct way that you'd expect with an adult you don't know, know. So you might sit on their lap or be very interested in their genitalia or yours with them. So very over familiar. You might be very fearful of certain individuals, normally the abuser. You might be very, very withdrawn, nightmares, bedwetting, fear of sleeping alone. So sometimes you might find the child always has a light on or some sort of noise stimulation uh, so they don't feel alone. You might have a child running away from home because obviously they want to get out of that situation. There might be developmental regression in how they're progressing cognitively and how they're behaving with people. Obviously, also, they might have the physical signs of bruises, scratchy. If you see a child with discharge, I would really be thinking red flags here because that's not normal for a child to have discharge, especially from the rectum, the vagina, the penis. So it's something you really want to be worrying about. If they're having urinary tract infections, pain on passing urine, STDs, we have to think about as well. And obviously for a girl, mm -hmm. if she's of a certain age, pregnancy. Also, you have to think about if this child is having difficulty walking or sitting, then we're going to have to be thinking about sexual abuse as well. And also on a scientific level, so cortisol levels, which are raised normally in the morning for everybody and also when you're stressed, they can be slightly higher in children who have been sexually abused and abused than non-abused children. That's, so that's something to keep in mind, actually. So how about socioeconomic status? From what I understand is that quite a lot of abuse can come from the lower social economic classes is that correct now the socioeconomic status it can happen again as i said in you know any status but it is slightly more common in the lower class they seem to come more to attention that might just be the reason and also quite wary of the relationship with the stepfather and stepdaughter some we found that there is a a higher risk between that relationship there and also if there's any incest sort of behavior that's normally associated with alcohol abuse if a family are very overcrowded in a home in a bedroom if there's increased physical proximity rural isolation can at times be a risk just because there's not as much support in the family system yeah, so for Laura, in her case, what has happened is that her family originates from Scotland, but they've moved to Canada. So for her, one of her issues is this idea of isolation. She doesn't have a support network. 
she hasn't got adults around her that she could voice her concerns to, even if she wanted to. I just thought that was quite interesting. Yeah. Now, I want to say about overcrowding. So when I mentioned when I was in Peru, so there was a really high, high prevalence of sexual abuse. And one of the reasons, I mean, I don't know if this is a reason, but we were told that So in Peru, in the homes we saw, there was only one bedroom and the father and the daughters were all sharing. And so there was a lot of incest and a lot of physical abuse as well. And women were subjected to rape from the men in the family. So that just ties in with close physical proximity and overcrowding in a home. I also hadn't considered how overcrowding can also provide an impact upon different types of abuse, particularly the sexual abuse. I hadn't realised that not only is isolation a problem, but so is the opposite. It's just these things that you go, ah, I didn't, didn't think of that before. Yeah. And I just wanted to mention another comment that goes with uh, abuse. So there's something called factitious disorder or Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Now, this is when an individual basically pretends a child has an illness in order to get medical attention. And that is the form of abuse. Why? Because that child would then be taken. So I'll give you an example. Mum is saying my child is having heart problems or go back to the heart problem. So then she takes the child to A&E and then this child is subjected to all these different investigations and some can be quite invasive. And then the mother can take the child again to another hospital. And that's a form of abuse because this child is being subjected to all these horrific tests when there is no problem, but the child's unable to say so because the mother is being quite quite objective the way she's saying it. But obviously, she's making this all up. So that's a form of abuse as well. This has been such a fascinating episode. And I can't tell you how much I've learned by asking you all these questions. And I would really like to thank you for coming onto the podcast to share information on child abuse. If there's anyone out there that has any additional questions as a result of listening to this podcast episode, please get in contact with us. You can reach us at the Mental Health Book Club by going to our website, which is mentalhealthbookclub.com. You can also find us on Twitter, which is MHBC underscore podcast, and on Facebook, which is Mental Health Book Club. You can reach out directly to The Secret Psych at thesecretpsychiatrist.com, or you can find her on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at The Secret Psych. I've also found some important telephone numbers if you need additional help with abuse. So for children, children can contact Childline at 0800 1111, which also has lots of information for adults as well. If you suspect that a child is in imminent and immediate danger from abuse, then dial 999 immediately and speak to the police. However, if you think that there is a child who is at risk of abuse, you can always contact the NSPCC, which has a 24-hour helpline on 0808 800 5000. And if you are in America, you can contact the Child Help National Child Abuse Hotline on 1-800-4-A-CHILD, which is 1-800-422-4453. Next week's episode will be another one featuring the secret psychiatrist as we discuss conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder. If you can't wait to listen to those episodes, you can get those now if you head over to Patreon at patreon.com forward slash MHBC and become a supporter of the Mental Health Book Club podcast. And for as little as $2 a month, you would be able to access our shows in advance and be eligible for additional awards. So remember, and the last thing that I would like to say is, it's okay to not be okay, and if you're not okay, talk. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Mental Health Book Club podcast. 
if you need additional help with your mental health, please contact the Samaritans on 116 123, which is a 24-hour helpline. And if you need additional information about mental health issues, please visit mind at mind.org.uk. Our next book will be Finding Audrey by Sophie Kinsella. Our next episode will be on conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder with the secret psychiatrist. If you'd like to find out more about the MHBC podcast, please visit our website, mentalhealthbookclub.com. We really hope that you enjoy this podcast and we would like to hear what you think. Please head over to Twitter, follow us at MHBC underscore podcast, or head over to Facebook and follow our Facebook page, which is Mental Health Book Club. If you would like to show your support further, please share us with your family and friends and leave us a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. We are now on Patreon. Please head over to patreon.com forward slash MHBC to donate as little as $2 a month to the Mental Health Book Club podcast. As a result of your donation, you will get early access to some of our episodes. You will get specific episodes that are only for patrons and you'll be eligible to be entered into free prize draws. 